So, uh, I, thanks. Um, I'm sensitive to the fact that I'm one of the few things standing between you guys and going home, so I'll try to be efficient. Actually, lunch is standing between you two, so there is, there is a lunch <laughs> And out lunch, there. too, which even is a, a greater imperative, perhaps. But um, uh, our uh, oversight group has been, uh, as you can see, talking about the future of these meetings, and one topic that has come up uh, a few times is uh, what's happening in the international community, and I think uh, the, the the, uh, the, the context is, of course, that we are not alone in our efforts to advance genomics into health and society, that uh, probably we cannot afford to be insular. And if we wish to, we have an opportunity, perhaps, to take a leadership role on the, in the international community. So um, uh, we, we address this topic because uh, genomic medicine doesn't have any particular uh, boundaries, as we've talked about. It doesn't uh, have, have disease-related boundaries, but certainly does not have uh, national boundaries, and as we are all aware that uh, there have been significant investments, and I may not have listed them all here, creating hubs for uh, uh, genome technologies across uh, the globe. And the, as, as was the case, I think, um, with the impetus for these meetings, uh, getting all of you together, the opportunity to explore the synergies, redundancies, and the potential to move the, advance the field forward is something that's on our minds when it pertains to the international a community as, as well. So could we perhaps create a more global agenda for genomic medicine as it pertains to the health globally, not global health as it's normally uh, thought about, but certainly could um, uh, impact that topic as well. Um, I thought I would uh, list uh, here uh, some uh, initiatives that have come to our attention in our uh, oversight group meetings. Um, some of you are uh, probably aware of many of them, uh, perhaps personally involved in some of them. And uh, what, I, what I hope to do, what I'd like to do is just give you a brief snapshot of, of these uh, five um, over the next few minutes. But I also want to recognize um, that there are um, many other efforts that have not necessarily been topics of conversation in our oversight group. Uh, and here, these are some of the uh, nationalities that have uh, come to our attention involved in the genomic medicine field. And, and while I'm on this slide, I'd really like to um, also uh, extend a welcome and uh, to Dr. Miyano from uh, Tokyo, from the Human Genome Center. Uh, so clearly we have uh, out, had outreach uh, to uh, the international community already, and we're grateful uh, for your being here to be participant in this, in this meeting. Uh, so I think one of the things that we're going to be looking for you to do is help us understand what, who might be the participants in such a meeting, uh, which uh, currently is not scheduled uh, with a definitive date, but probably will happen uh, sometime in the fall. So uh, first, um, I think in our discussions, we've recognized that the Canadians, and specifically the Genome Canada Initiative to Advance Genomics and Personalized Medicine into Healthcare, um, through a, a very large um, uh, a large project RFA for 2012 called Genomic, Genomics and Personalized Medicine is probably one of the more advanced uh, countries uh, leading the, the efforts. You can see uh, the tenor of the RFA here, um, and this probably sounds like something very much like our own demonstration projects to support projects that will demonstrate how genomics-based research can contribute to a more evidence-based approach to health and improving cost-effectiveness of the healthcare system. Uh, the total funding for this um, um, uh, projects that we'll initiate this year is around $130 million, $40 million from uh, the government, Genome Canada, um, $22.5 million through the uh, Canadian Institute for Health Research and some other small funding agencies. And importantly, um, the emphasis of these, uh, a requirement of these applications was uh, co-funding generally through commercial en entities to supply uh, up to uh, at least 50 percent of the funding opportunity. Uh, the, the decisions were made uh, last month. I don't know what they were, but about 10 to 12 projects are slated to initiate uh, very shortly. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, attend a, a workshop um, in Israel uh, this fall, um, uh, sponsored by the National Institute for Health Research Policy. Uh, the agenda for the workshop, as you can see here, also has some resonance with uh, topics that we've discussed here um, many times, how to assess the, the value proposition for personalized medicine. Um, both from an economic point of view and developing the evidence base through the comparative effectiveness research, the policy agenda, um, and also what are some of the barriers to implementing, implementing personalized medicine. Uh, the output of that workshop um, is a white paper that um, uh, has elements that, again, uh, resonate with our to topics that we've discussed here, the knowledge gap in educating health professionals, obviously the topic of this meeting, how to create a data sharing. A framework uh, within Israel, uh, a collaborative um, 
uh, frameworks as well. Um, and all of this is going towards to the Ministry of Health um, as a proposal to uh, support and provide uh, resources to enable uh, genomic and personalized medicine uh, within Israel. And one of the interesting things about that particular environment is that 100% um, of the population is covered by four HMOs. And the HMOs appear to be very willing to collaborate with each other on really under, on gathering data, uh, generating the evidence, and also uh, creating uh, the economic models that uh, support the advancement of genomics in uh, healthcare. Um, the, um, we came, we, uh, last, about a year ago, the uh, United Kingdom published a, uh, a strategy document. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know that any of this has truly been implemented, but again, um, many themes uh, in, in the UK's uh, strategy for genomics and healthcare are, are similar to our own. Uh, how do we uh, get it adopted mainstream? What are the translational pathways? What's the infrastructure? Bioinformatics uh, is a, is, and training are clear themes and the policy agenda uh, um, as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to see how uh, uh, many uh, international communities are working in parallel. Uh, as was mentioned earlier um, uh, today or yesterday, uh, Dan Roden um, is, on, uh, is on loan to the European Science Foundation uh, at a meeting uh, in which they're discussing these uh, very uh, an, uh, si similar types of initiatives. This was a report that came to our attention just several months ago, Personalized Medicine in the European Citizen. So again, il again illustrative also some of some of the fragmentation. The UK has its own strategy. The rest of Europe has, has theirs. And although the words are slightly different on, on the focal points for the ESF initiative, um, I think if you look at them carefully, they are uh, very synonymous with um, what the UK uh, and what we're doing here in the US are really thinking about doing. Again, um, we'll hear back from Dan, uh, hopefully, uh, about his experience there, um, but the early reports um, from his presentation about what we're doing indicated there was a lot of interest in, in, in partnering. Um, I also wanted to um, give you a sense of what the World Economic Forum is uh, thinking about this topic. Um, uh, Lord Aradarcy uh, was chair of a genetics and medicine committee uh, for a year or so. Um, at the WEF, um, and they published a white paper result in the New England Journal of Medicine about um, uh, 12 or 14 months ago that um, articulated the output of that uh, sort of primordial uh, committee on this topic. Uh, again, several of, the, several of the themes that you see are, are things that we've discussed um, and certainly touched on in many of these meetings. Uh, that committee has been reassembled, or actually disbanded, and then reassembled uh, this summer um, to a global agenda uh, committee on personalized and precision health. Um, as you can see, it has somewhat uh, global representation. There's a high, there's a strong footprint from the United States. Francis Collins uh, and Peggy Hamburger on this committee, and Victor Zhao uh, chairs it. And the, uh, the, the WEF met last week in Davos, as some of you know. And uh, these were some of the outputs of that meeting uh, on this topic. So uh, there were three initiatives that were uh, provisionally approved uh, for resources from uh, the Board of Governors from the World Economic Forum. The first one was um, to uh, address the global, to, to understand how uh, personalized medicine and genomic medicine technologies might be helpful in addressing the global economic burden of disease. This relates to another initiative at the WEF, which is called Sustainable Health Systems, in which uh, uh, a um, uh, a model of, of, uh, of healthcare uh, economics and the disease drivers of, uh, of the economic burden in several countries was articulated over the last year. That report has been presented, and the question is, are there approaches that can synergize with uh, alleviating that uh, health economic burden of disease in various uh, global economies? So uh, a number of committee members from our Global Agenda Council will be uh, creating a white paper on the value proposition of personalized healthcare approaches in various world economies. That obviously sounds quite synonymous or quite um, synergistic with what the World Economic Forum might want to do. Uh, the second um, uh, area that uh, is also uh, was widely discussed in the, at the Global Agenda uh, Council was uh, big data, data sharing, data sharing frameworks. Um, Charles Sawyers is a member of the committee. He uh, chaired the IOM panel on uh, toward precision medicine, in which this topic was uh, 
very much a, a thread through, the entire, through its entirety. And Francis Collins, I think, has had a significant impact on uh, helping us uh, think through this. So um, the idea, essentially, which seems to have been approved, is to, um, uh, with a knowledge partner, and that's, a, that's WEF terminology for the likes of McKinsey, Deloitte, or Price Waterhouse, uh, to um, really understand the landscape and the gaps uh, that would exist to try to create a global data commons uh, that would uh, accum assimilate a lot of genomic and healthcare related information. So again, this sounds uh, very much uh, synergistic with uh, big data and other uh, topics that we've, we've talked about here. Uh, and then the last uh, uh, topic that was uh, discussed and uh, uh, again provisionally approved was, uh, was trying to begin to understand uh, the, um, what is needed to achieve greater harmonization and alignment in both regulatory approval strategies as well as reimbursement strategies for uh, genome-based technologies. And I, I'm sure that Peggy Hamburg also had a strong hand in uh, putting this uh, agenda item forward. Um, so the, uh, the output which we uh, uh, anticipate seeing over the next year is a, is a workshop of the global community to address some of these policy issues. And, perhaps a white paper that will articulate what those policy alignment strategies would be. So I think I've given you in the in a last few minutes a snapshot of some of the uh, gears that are turning on the international scene uh, that are very much related to our agenda here. So um, we've, uh, we, we haven't fleshed this out in, in any great detail. Um, uh, that was one of the things we realized last night at dinner, why we couldn't really conceive of putting on a meeting of the international community in May without having engaged all of you as well as even ourselves in trying to think about what that agenda would look like. I think the answer to this question about should we is probably answered yes, and Eric may want to comment, but he certainly uh, has told us that he's been uh, the subject of a lot of inquiries on the international, from the international community about how to really engage with NHGRI and the activities of, of this group. Um, why should we do this? I, I think. Um, uh, identifying, uh, as I said earlier, the commonalities and addressing barriers and solutions, synergies and eliminating redundancy, um, the kinds of things we've talked about in terms of standardization of, of data, standardization of CDS, standardization of genomic variants and a number of other um, uh, technologies could certainly be brought to, the, to another level and the global community is probably also addressing that. The notion of international pilot projects of which Genome Canada has already taken a, uh, a first step is something that we could also perhaps leverage some of the activities that we've talked about here um, and bring in international resources to, uh, to help enable those uh, public-private partnerships, understanding the economic models, uh, the policy issues, um, and also the ability to work in, uh, in perhaps environments that might make it even easier to capture the data, single state, single payer types of uh, countries or, um, uh, or environments where that data is read more readily available than perhaps in the fragmented system in which we currently operate uh, here. So I think you can appreciate the, you know, the litany of potential ideas that might emerge from such a meeting. I'm sure you could think of many of your own. Uh, we've certainly thought about who should we invite. I think there's, a, on, on the one hand, we would probably want to attract the leaders of the ministries of health that are making the policy decisions to fund these types of things, but they may be not well connected enough to the science to uh, speak cogently about what the scientific agenda should be. So uh, we thought about actually trying to perhaps bring uh, both flavors to a meeting like this. That's not uh, etched in stone. Um, and also we would uh, also choose to have this meeting also in Washington, D.C. for obvious reasons. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there and uh, open it up for discussions, questions, or comments. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Howard. Thanks, Jeff. I would, I would add that the uh, um, emerging countries, as they're called, uh, we should also be thinking about it. The, the developing countries have problems way beyond genomics, but at least with pharmacogenomics, which I know is only a small part of it, I've been shocked at the level of implementation that's already gone on <clears throat> in terms of routine use of pharmacogenomics mm -hmm. in Thailand and in China. And, you know, I, you think about it as something, you know, we're not doing it here, no one's doing it. They're doing it routinely and it's paid for for things like avoiding Stevens-Johnson syndrome mm -hmm. with novarapine, carbamazepine, allopurinol uh, in Thailand. And then in China there are both commercial and uh, uh, 
government funded, I guess you, they're all the same over there, um, that is, is um, now in major hospitals. Uh, so there, there, there really is a lot more going on out there mm -hmm. than I, I realized. Um, and uh, we, can, we can really try to pull that in because I think we could actually learn from what they're doing as opposed to um, the assumption that they will be learning from us. Yeah, that, well, that's a that's a fantastic point, and I, I would mention uh, you know that I think on one of my earlier slides I didn't I didn't uh, mention specifically, but the H three Africa initiative is one of those uh, initiatives to bring genomics into develop the developing world. In a sense, I think would be uh, resin, you know constant with what you just said. Um, we know that uh, uh, Y T Chen in Taiwan has been highly successful in uh, executing on. Uh, genomic, genetic guided clinical trials for things like carbamazepine and has uh, changed the way that uh, the practice of medicine in, in some of those countries. And maybe you'd like to just mention a couple of words on PGNE, your initiative in this, in this area. Uh, if we could have the first slide, please. No, I'm just sure. <laughs> um, so, so what, uh, we've, been, we've, been using, we've been using pharmacogenomics in a kind of a weird way. Uh, we've been working with developing countries, so not the emerging ones as much, but the developing countries that may not have clean water or electricity, but one of their major decisions is choosing their national formulary. And so uh, they rely predominantly on white data uh, for, for, because uh, with our recent FDA analysis, 87% of the pivotal uh, FDA data comes from white patients. And so if you're in Ghana or in, in Myanmar, you're relying on white data to try to make your national formulary decision. So we take pharmacogenetic risk, risk data from local populations um, merge that with the, the white data from Geneva uh, to come up with a national formulary recommendation for each individual country. And so it's population or public health genomics, not individual patient genomics. But it's been uh, a, a great experience and it's caused the ministries of health to think of genomics in a different way because they're scared of BRCA and Alzheimer's or whatever, but they're not scared of safe medicine. And so it's been kind of a way of introducing that as well. Thanks, Howard. Great. Uh, John? I, th I think the, uh, our international colleagues face uh, very different uh, implementation barriers than we do. And in some situations, there are fairly large databases already put together of clinical material that I hope those, are, those scientists will be in part of this and invited, like 500 whole exomes that have been for a specific uh, phenotype. Those kinds of uh, studies could provide huge insights for us. Yeah, I, uh, well, first of all, I, thank you. I would, I would say that one of the things uh, we would encourage all of you to do is to uh, send us your ideas of, of what we might want to highlight at, at such, a, such a venue. Um, so if you know of specific um, projects uh, or specific, uh, you know, collaborators of yours or, or people that uh, could make a significant contribution in illuminating uh, the commonalities as well as the diversity and heterogeneity of the challenges that we face. Um, we'd like to hear from you because uh, we've just, you know, we're just, our, we're, we're very myopic in some ways of our own. But I think we can leverage the, the crowd here in terms of your, I know you, a lot of you have frequent flyer models that uh, justify that so that you've, you've traveled to a lot of these places, you collaborate with a lot of international groups and we want to make sure that we uh, highlight those that are really uh, helping to drive this agenda. So by all means. Um, before I call on Mike, I, I might just comment that, that we do probably, or maybe this is a question, do we, um, want to have an emphasis more on the implementation side than the discovery side. And, and I, I think, you know, to the degree that they're doing implementation in actual patient care, I think yeah. that would be the kinds of projects. That's what you're talking about. Uh, but they're both uh, uh, academically oriented, and then there are some uh, very obvious businesses that are quite international in their scope that uh, are making major moves in terms of trying to capture as much of the world's business as possible. Yeah, I, we, we should, we'll, uh, that's a, I, I think that's a good point. And, we've, and, and many of the themes, t topics that we've talked about here, the, the business uh, opportunities have, are, haven't been on our, our, you know, our major focus. So uh, we might uh, take that as a separate topic altogether. Um, but I think as, as healthcare delivery systems struggle with um, the, uh, the ability to put this into their work streams and to develop the, uh, the, the value proposition on a number of different levels, patient provider system, economic, 
Uh, that's really we want, I think that's the place that we want to focus our, uh, the, most of our attention. So the extent that, this, that's there, that the businesses are enabling of that, that would, certainly, that would be um, uh, an opportunity, I think. Okay, um, Mike, you had a comment? Briefly, that uh, I've been to a couple of these international meetings, and there there is a lot of interest in WHO in resourcing some of the developing countries. Um, that's all they will put their money towards is the developing countries. Um, and then UNESCO has established it's around a particular project, which I won't talk about uh, the viability of that particular project, but. Uh, they've established clinical annotation of the genome as one of their highest priority projects internationally. Um, I was at a meeting there last summer in Paris with, at UNESCO where they've been, they've been trying to develop this. Um, it's going to be exceedingly useless for the United States at this point in time because we're out of UNESCO for funding purposes because of having brought the Palestinians into UNESCO and our, our laws that don't allow us to play in places where they play. Um, and they may, we may get over that hump, but for the rest of the world, UNESCO is likely to, to be able to resource some of this stuff and is very interested in, in working through their connections to other countries to develop uh, genomic annotation and understand the, you know, the genomic backgrounds in many of these countries, as Howard alluded to um, with his pharmacogenetics project, because these, that's, you know, there's some of the variation is going to be around those backgrounds on which the stuff's operating. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Michael. Other comments? I have one. Yes, please. Um, as you begin to think about the audience with the implementation as the perspective of the, of the meeting, and I know the agenda may be too large for this, but also consider the varied healthcare professionals that are implementing it across those countries. We have a very good collaboration with the United Kingdom Nursing Group, which is extremely active over there. So just a, a thought for future consideration. Thank you. And it, it could be that some of the things uh, that we've talked about even in this meeting yesterday about uh, health professional education might take on an international flavor at some point. So that might be one of the ways to bring in that concept. Uh, thanks for raising it. Sure. And we may want, want to ask a, you know, a planning group to kind of define what the goals for this meeting would be because yeah. obviously, you know, there's, there's a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, so it seems as though we have reasonable agreement that this is something to, to go forward with. Any, any objections or concerns that haven't been voiced? Okay, great. All right, then I think we can thank Jeff. And we're getting close to the end of our, of our effort here. Um, one thing that was suggested in terms of heading back to the airport, the, I mean, sorry, we're in the airport, heading back to your terminal because it's an enormous airport. Um, so we're in, in Terminal C. It seems as though you, you need almost to take the shuttle from the hotel, to, although apparently Howard says there's a walking route that's, that's up and down stairs and that... Really? Okay. Um, so follow Howard if you want to, if you want to do that. Um, if you do want to take the shuttle, it leaves every 20 minutes on the, on the hour, but of course there are other 20 minutes that aren't, so there's 9, 920, or, or 2, 220, 240. Um, do be considerate of, of those who have earlier flights and, and kind of let them take the first shuttles if, the, if they get full. Um, I did want to thank heartily uh, Jean Passamani and Mark Williams uh, for putting together this program, and especially Richard Fogley, who did so much work in making it all work. So thank you, Richard. <laughs> and uh, any closing comments from Dr. Williams? No, I think uh, just thanks to everyone. I mean, the success of these meetings is basically uh, due to the uh, participation and the engagement. And uh, we recognize that uh, this is, uh, for the most part, all being done uh, as volunteerism. Uh, and um, uh, we think that uh, it's been, because we've been uh, sensitive to what the group has really wanted to do, that we, in fact, continue to accrue more and more attendees which in some sense is a metric of the success, and we hope that that will continue uh, in the future. And a special thanks to all of the presenters, um, those that are still here and those that have already uh, uh, headed back home. And thanks to those of you who have, in the course of the meeting, volunteered to participate in some other aspects of the work that we're doing. So uh, lunch is available and uh, safe travels to all. <laughs>